the agent-based modeling process. And um, this is going to be a quite broad lecture. And it's important that we push on uh, during the next class to a different set of topics. I don't know if I'm going to have the opportunity to go into elements of this in as much detail. So I might end up having to sort of pull some elements into the next um, set of lectures that will cover some of the material I'm going to have to leave um, to un uncover in today's lecture. Um, I do want to, um, um, to, to give some flavor of how the agent-based modeling process differs from from other simulation modeling processes, particularly from the system dynamics, classic system dynamics modeling process here, you'll find there's tremendous similarity and, and also some important salient differences. And I'm going to try to draw attention to them. I'm, at, at a very high level, um, there's a quite different flavor to the toolbox which you use in the system dynamics world on the one hand and agent-based models on the other. And it struck me that the old Russian proverb about the fox and the hedgehog is relevant. Some of you may be familiar with that. Um, the hedgehog kind of being the representing uh, people who know uh, an awful lot about just a few small things and use that, that wisdom. Um, as one strategy which it uses really, really well in lots of different cases and specializes in that versus the strategy of the fox, which knows a little bit about a lot of different things and exhibits great flexibility. And stock and flow models, which I use very, very widely um, in my, my research work uh, and in consulting engagements, I think of as kind of um, hedgehog um, type sort of analogous to hedgehog knowledge. You have a small modeling vocabulary, a small, extremely powerful modeling vocabulary, consisting of stocks, flows, and of course, some other variables that, that sort of feed into them, and, and, uh, and an analysis approach which really centers on them, where you go in, and, and, uh, in a system dynamics model, you, you look at the stocks and the flows, and you reason about it, you reason about the feedbacks involved, and get great insight. And just those few elements combined together can be tremendous and powerful. Agent-based modeling, you're in a rather different situation. You have a large modeling vocabulary when it comes to agent-based models. So there's a lot of different things that you're going to have to think about when it comes to agent-based models, pieces out of which you build that model. We're talking here about primitives uh, in, a, in, a, in a computer jargon for, um, sense. We have just a few, a small basis set, to use a mathematical term, a small number of very general primitives here. And over here, in agent-based modeling, uh, by contrast, we have a much broader palette on which to draw, quite literally in any logic, that thing on the right-hand side. And you have different subsets of the vocabulary that are used for different models. Uh, the power here is in flexibility, you can draw, have models with drawn different subsets here, and the combination of elements as well. And this variety of focuses, uh, in, in system dynamics, we focus our analysis on the stocks and the flows and the feedbacks that unite them. We focus on, on uh, you know, the phenomena of, of stasis and delays associated with, with stocks, et cetera. In agent-based modeling, our analysis is less driven by the primitives we put in there, and we have a much more sort of uh, uh, holistic analysis uh, methodology that gets used, and um, we're going to see that in some elements of the course. So in agent-based models, these are many of the pieces out of which you'll build a model, or the components, the elements that you need to consider when building up a model. Um, one thing is, is the notion of events. Any logic has uh, two types of events, static events, what are called static events, and dynamic events. Um, the terminology there is very confusing, um, uh, but suffice it to say that these are events which fire over time um, uh, to trigger some actions typically. So they may, trick, they may occur at you know, every beginning of every year or end of every day to record some information or to cause something to happen. Or they may 
occur in sort of irregular fashion. Uh, you have multiple mechanisms for describing dynamics. In system dynamics, <coughs> stock and flow modeling, you have stocks and flows to describe the dynamics, to describe the behavior of the system, and it's very powerful. Here we have stocks and flows, to be sure, but we also have state diagrams, so we have custom update code. Whether it's illustrated graphically or not, or as directly a Java code, to update components of our model over time. Um, and this allows us a, a sort of a much broader set of ways of describing how the model evolves over time. From a computational perspective, you can model pretty much anything in either framework. The question is how convenient, how expressive, how transparent is it? How easy is it to build? How clear is it to communicate? And um, how, how useful to answer your types of questions? Here we have a, a figure of how to deal with. We have interagent communication that we have to consider. I mentioned this notion of sending messages and receiving messages. This is very much part of what we have to think about in an agent context. Transitions, we saw those transitions between states. We added a transition, waning immunity. We have transitions for becoming infected or um, recovering. And it turns out that each transition can be of a couple different sorts. We can have a transition of the sort that is associated with classic system dynamics models, with the flows of system dynamics model. Your chance of leaving in a given unit of time via a given flow is the same regardless of how long you've been in that stock. If you're a person and you're in that infectious stock, you have a certain chance. But you have time of moving out, that's the same whether you've been there one time unit or 50 time units. I'm abstracting over detail. There's a thing called delay fix to which you, know, you can use. But broadly speaking, in system dynamics, we typically have first order or nth order delays, and you have this, this uh, within a given stock of memories. Um, here we actually have a much richer set of possibilities. We can have memory full stops. We can have more and more likely to transition out the longer you've been there. So the longer you've had obesity, the more likely it is per year that you'll develop diabetes, for example. Diverse types of agents, multiple types of agents model can interact. Spatial and co topological connectivity, fancy words, but basically we can lay people out on a map of sorts, or we can have them connected via networks. One or more networks. You can have both networks and maps simultaneously. You can have your friends connected via network, and then you have interactions in terms of pathogen transmission. So ideas from friends, pathogen transmission, spatial. Subtyping. This is a, a, a notion that some of you may be familiar with if you have a little bit more software background. But basically, we can have person personhood defined, then we can have males and females, which share characteristics of personhood but have different unique characteristics each unto themselves. And that can be captured with subtyping. Or we can have servants, which capture the fact that we have these ungulates that run around puffed in the woods of Saskatchewan. That, that is my home. Um, and then we can have deer and elk and moose and um, all those good creatures <laughs> which visit our land um, and of which we are so fond. Um, <laughs> mobility and movement. Those animals um, can, can move around. <laughs> Sometimes rather quickly. And uh, and we often want to capture that movement because it gives rise to contact patterns. It gives rise to um, spatial movement of, of infection of our landscape. And mobility and movement is going to be the topic of one or two lectures within this class. How do we capture that? How do we have these agents not just sit there and infect their neighbors in a static sort of way, but bop around as they have risk of infection, try to move away from an encroaching uh, a wave of infection, shield themselves, um, or move towards resources, which they can make use of, move towards forage for deer, for example. Um, graphical interfaces. In, in um, agent-based modeling, 
visualization is often a really valuable and compelling tool. Compelling for understanding what's going on. Valuable in terms of communicating uh, to, to others and uh, picking out really important phenomena. Uh, having worked in system dynamics with uh, agent-based models implemented in system dynamics, one of the biggest things I found hampering insight was the lack of ability to visualize networks and network spread of infection. Even though I had a network in the model, I had a connectivity matrix which said who's connected with whom and it was all good. It was really awkward to understand what was really going on in terms of spatially and topologically. And having that graphical interface can be very useful. It can also be useful for changing assumptions. We'll see how to build up these interfaces in a point and click sort of way, in a drag and drop sort of way within any logic. Very powerful and uh, very important, actually. It's not really eye-candy. Data output mechanisms. How do you save away the data? How do you capture those insights from the models in a persistent way. Um, stochastics complicate, complicate scenario result interpretation, calibration, and sensitivity analysis. How do you know when you get a really good batch of a model to observe data, whether it's a fluke? Just a fluke. It happened to be good this time. Next time it will be bad. If we want robust conclusions, about the trade-off between different policies, for example. We'd like to be able to make sure that our, our results are robust under the vagaries of stochastics. And we, we can, there are ways to deal with this with the age-based modeling that go beyond what we need to worry about within system dynamics, classically, yes. tremendous pandemic that sweeps across the space. 
if I only run that model once or twice or four times, what have you, I might miss that, right? So here, when we have stochastics, they complicate our ability to, to derive insights from the model because we do have to run the model many times to get confidence that we've seen something representative of what the underlying model can produce. We also need to take it into account when we calibrate the model. We're adjusting parameters of the model so that it best captures the historically observed data. We don't want to just evaluate its match to that historic data from a single run. We want to actually run it several times because for evaluating from a single run, as I said, it might just be by luck of the draw, it matches very well. The next time it matches poorly. So calibration is complicated because of this. And in fact, sensitivity analysis, if we're trying to understand how the model differs, for different values of parameters. We can't just do it with a single run. With the system dynamics model, we, we could because it's deterministic. I'm not saying all system dynamics models are deterministic. In fact, I've run many where we've deliberately built in randomness, but it's more typical for them to be deterministic and much more typical, and traditionally they, they have been um, deterministic. In calibration, we just run it once to assess for this given set of assumptions on parameters, what are the results? We just run it a single time. So in terms of reproducibility, what I'm saying is that there's, when we look at a model with a certain set of assumptions, as encoded by parameters, let's say, a particular version of the model, a particular structure, a dynamic hypothesis captured by that structure, we, in Asian-based modeling, is in almost invariably stochastics um, that lead to variability in results. And the question is, is that observed sufficiently to give you robust calibration or robust um, sort of uh, conclusions from that model? Uh, it's not going to be reproducible in the precise outputs gained except if you run it again with the same so-called random number C, the same sequence of randomly generated numbers used to, to run the model. Um, and that should be reproducible. If you do it with the same C, you should get out exactly the same results. The problem is that typically you want a reason to be have robust conclusions. You want to reason about it with, a, with respect to a wide variety of different runs of the model. And so we have to run it again and again and again to do that. So our, our broad weapon here is to run the model under a so-called ensemble of realizations. Uh, in other words, we run it many times. And that's what we do. And that takes a lot of computing power. Right? Um, fortunately, it can be done. It's, it's what we call embarrassingly parallel. It's, it's just so manifestly parallel, we can just run it on several machines at the same time. We don't have to worry about the you know, dependencies. So. so stochastics here get in the way of, of reproducibility in terms of the micro results, but we try to guard against that through leveraging large groups of runs and, and essentially through statistical mechanisms that allow us to develop confidence and kind of got good confidence intervals around, around our results. It's a different issue than not knowing with what model or what model assumptions my results were gained that I'm reporting in this paper. Oh, that's, what that's what I meant. Oh. Yeah, which which is sounds trivial, but it's not. Believe me, you talk with my modeling colleagues, publish a lot. It's a very unsettling thing because we produce within our modeling, the modeling enterprise, we produce massive numbers of runs. And it's very easy, if we're not very careful, to, to uh, misplace full documentation on where results came from. With my precise assumptions about the model parameters and the model exact model version used. And then, two years from now, two months from now, we may be called upon to reproduce it and uh, put it, you know, in, and uh, we may have 
an unsettling feeling of uncertainty as to whether, in fact, we've captured the right version of the model. Okay. Um, and there's some further issues with with sort of the uh, uh, the fact that different components of the model, in fact, uh, are running in parallel and need to uh, you have agents simultaneously are kind of running in parallel and need to communicate with each other via messages. So, so um, modeling process uh, is a is something that starts uh, at its earliest ver uh, earliest level with um, problem conceptualization. Makes its way through um, mapping out of a model at a, at a qualitative level. That does go on with an agent based modeling. It's not talked about much. And in fact, it proceeds then through precise model formulation, unambiguous specification of a model, model calibration, making sure that within the broad confines of what this can represent, that you've got the broad, the, the right set of parameters, for example. Um, testing of the model, make sure it's something that you're really comfortable with, or you have to go back and re-examine it. Evaluation of policies and some efforts at knowledge translation. Now, interestingly, within the agent-based modeling literature, there's much more focus on this point onwards in the modeling process, and particularly, I'd say, sort of uh, these components and these components, uh, not too much you'll find in here. But you know, people need to know they need to be careful about those things. Um, but there's a lot on sort of the model as an artifact. It's the model that's produced that's often looked to as the value of the modeling process. From a system dynamics, classic system dynamics perspective, it's the modeling process as much as the, the model that's produced that offers value. It's often the thinking through the issues systematically about what's going on there in the world. The learning that comes from the model um, is a part of that, but it's not all of it. And often it's thinking through how the system works and developing, um, developing a sort of insights into the broader uh, components, the interaction of components of the system and uh, the changes in relationship between those and different pieces of the system that give rise to insight. It's the coordination that emerges from that, not merely the, the insights from the quantitative model. But, but agent-based models go through a, a broad set of, of um, stages like this. And I have found uh, within the recent literature very heartening attempts to to formalize some of these earlier steps in the process using what's known as the ODD protocol, which stands for overview, design concepts, and details. Uh, this is a consensus protocol that was derived from a set of agent-based modelers for specifying agent-based models. And the impetus for this lay in significant part the need to communicate these models effectively with others, with other modelers, with, with uh, experts in the domain of application of the model in a way that was clear, um, that would allow the model to be reproduced. And that wouldn't rely upon simply publishing pages and pages and pages of computer code, which is an impoverished way to describe model functionality. It's, a, it's an opaque way for a lot of people. So uh, a set of a panel of modelers uh, got together and defined a protocol that lays out what needs to be specified. And associated with that has come to be a sort of a process of building the model that involves reflection on different pieces of a model. And it was that process that, that um, led to this sheet of paper that I provided to all of you today which lays out the design concepts that are the middle piece of this. Um, some of the issues. We're not going to have time to go into those in great detail. Um, but that sheet highlights some of the components that I'm not going to be able to talk about much within this lecture. 
There's three broad components, though, as indicated by the this remaining elements of details. Um, so overview, long goals, high-level scope and design. Something again, you just haven't heard much talk about previous and divination-based modeling, but it's extremely important, arguably the most important stage of the process. Design concepts. These draw a lot on a particulars of the agent-based modeling philosophy. The notion of wanting to reproduce patterns as emergent phenomenon from representing simple mechanics as opposed to building them into a model. In the design concept, concepts you'll see, they're drawn elements that are really um, serve as motivation for these sort of models. Things like learning. Learning is hard to, to capture in a really rich way within an aggregate model. Individual based learning. The fact that, for example, people learn from traffic patterns within the city, which way they should go at a certain time of day, get to a destination. Um, people are, you know, uh, once per or once per twice shy. They say, right? You you have a, a bad experience. You come to anticipate it in your behavior, adjust your behavior accordingly. Um, learning can be captured at an individual level quite richly within agent-based models. Uh, adaptivity to the environment, etc. Behavioral change. Finally, there's a set of details. So we're going to talk about this um, very briefly here. And again, I may go into it more in, in other lectures. So um, I think I'll skip, skip this, because that had much in common with system dynamics. Um, OK, so let's talk about uh, the components of this. So the overview stage, the O of the ODD, um, we focus on describing model purpose the definition of key elements of the model, the entities, which include the agents, as well as aspects of the environment, local and global. Global environment affecting all agents, regardless of location and position in a network. Local environment perhaps having to do with the particularities of, of the, say, the neighborhoods in which they're located or their, their spatial location, things that are specific to one that can be different from one spatial location to another. So these are classified as entities. The states, the, the uh, pieces of information that evolve for agents, as well as the parameters, in scales. These are time scales and, and spatial scales. And then there's a, a process overview that describes sort of how do agents evolve? How do these entities evolve over time? I'd like to draw your attention in reviewing these slides. Um, to the fact that I've tried to articulate the mapping of this to this traditional sort of flow of modeling here. So in the very earliest phases is when this O stage is going on, the problem and the research question articulation. And we're articulating patterns that require explanation. And then we're trying to find a model scope, um, trying to find the entities, and outputs of interest in the states associated with those entities and the environments. So let's talk about the problem. So those who have gone through system dynamics courses are very familiar with the, the importance of articulating the problem up front. The, the comment here, which is often used, is George Fox's comment that all models are wrong, but some are useful. All models are by necessity simplifications. Agent-based models are seductive in the sense that we can go arbitrarily rich with our description of this external world. It's, it's an extremely, um, extremely rich mechanism for describing things in the world. However, no matter how deep you go, it's going to be a simplification. It's going to abstract over many details and hide those details. Um, it's going to depart from how things work in the world at some level. Agent-based modeling is sometimes called modeling from the bottom up, but there is no bottom, you know, in terms of how things are in the world. Uh, and we have to be conscious of the fact that while it affords us a very rich description, we will have to, of necessity, simplify and, and step away from uh, an attempt to exactly depict things at some point. So we don't want to try to reproduce exactly 
exactly how the world works for its own sake. Typically, we use a model purpose as a logical knife to cut away unnecessary complexity. We say, what is the question we're trying to address? And we're trying to only include those things that are essential, plausibly essential for capturing that phenomenon. Bearing in mind that we can re-examine our choice over time as we learn from our model. Okay? So we try to use patterns, including what are called system you know, reference modes, observations about how the world works. It may be qualitative in nature, like there are these waves that occur over space for radius. It may have to do with patterns over time, not, not over space, but over time. And we want to explain them. Or we have some problem that, you know, cases of SDIs have been rising rapidly. They, they declined for a while. Now they're risen rapidly. Why is this? So we bring some reference modes, some, some descriptions of patterns in the world to bear. And we have to think about, OK, how simple could our model be? You know, Einstein commented, model should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Where is that boundary? How simple could we get where it's at least still plausible we've captured the salient things to answer our question, but in, in throwing out any more could be, could be really obviously problematic, but adding things in would just plausibly complicate without adding a lot of, a lot of uh, clear value. So adding factors here often does not yield greater insight. Sometimes simple models give the greatest insight. You're going to have to ask when you build the model, is my purpose to reproduce possibly those things in the world in general that are relevant? Or is my goal to try to demonstrate just how a few processes could explain a phenomenon, could explain a phenomenon by themselves? Putting aside whether it's an accurate representation of how things in the world are, is this a model purely for insight, or is it a model to try to capture the relevant factors in the world uh, that, are, that are most important to the phenomenon? That's a question we often have to ask here. The issue here is that creating more complex model often takes more time to build and less time to insight. You can build up a model that's extremely rich, but there's so many moving parts that you've kind of lost track of, of the learning involved. You, you sort of observe something, but so what? Um, so I run it this way, it gives this result. I run it that way, it gives that result. I have no sense of why I'm seeing these results, where they're coming from, from what interactions are the most important, et cetera. So you know, various great people have placed the importance of, of constancy of purpose. Um, and in modeling, it's, it's uh, it's essential. Now, with agent-based models, the flexibility here is it's tempting to put aside many of these constraints, but take it from someone who's you know, seen, seen models that are too complex um, and has talked with colleagues who have made the mistake of putting in too much to model and just sort of casting around without a lot of benefit from it. Um, you got to be really careful to start simple. There's a principle sometimes used in software engineering, most notably uh, agile software engineering, for those for whom that's a meaningful term, um, called YAGMI. You ain't going to need it. With an agent-based model, you can throw in the kitchen sink very easily. You can add in, okay, so you add a, you're thinking about perhaps a, per, uh, a, a certain model, you want to characterize some phenomenon, and you start adding in pieces to it, attributes of a person alone, right? Start adding in, well, you know, maybe we want to keep track of their location. Maybe we want to keep track of their, their height and weight as well. You know, maybe we want to keep track of parent-child relationships. Maybe we want to keep track of families and who's in the same family. And, and you know, well, there's this whole issue of assortivity and, and um, people's relationships. Maybe we want to capture that. You can add all this detail into the model. But there's an opportunity cost. That time could have been spent with a much simpler model, learning from it, and adding in very selectively what, it, what you think plausibly is the highest priority. 
to, to, to add in, or in fact, finding great insight from just how a few pieces work together and sharing that insight with others. So the editing principle I think here is very important. If you can plausibly, without, if you can pass the red face test with your model, there's enough there that no one's gonna simply think it's ludicrously too simple for your purposes. Start, start that way. Then add in only systematically. You can build up the model step by step by step. Okay, the key thing we wanna think about, now this is from the system dynamics world, but it applies directly to Asian-based model. So I'm gonna throw this in here. When, you're, when you've got a model, divide the things that you're considering into three pieces. The three classes, when you're thinking about issues of germane to your research question and to the patterns to explain them. There are some factors that are gonna be in the model as what are called endogenous, endogenous. They are things whose dynamics are calculated as part of the model. They're processes that are being simulated within the model mechanistically. We are simulating their changes over time in them. It is calculating those values over time based on other factors. These are endogenously simulated items. There's exogenously captured factors. These are factors that are represented again in the model like endogenous factors. However, they change only in ways that are fixed, defined. So they may be constants or they may be time series. They're represented. There is something for income disparity in our model, perhaps. There is something for you know, people's uh, uh, the, 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 the tax, uh, taxes associated with, um, with uh, you know, uh, alcohol, for example, in our model, or tobacco. But we assume that they're changing in some fixed way. Or we have fixed values for them. We assume it's a certain fixed quantity that we can vary scenario to scenario. These are represented, but they're not being calculated as part of the model. They're being told to the model. We're telling the model, assume this, assume that. But it considers them. Just like you considered endogenous. But here it's calculated, and here it's not. And then there's things that are excluded from the model, that are simply left out of the model. But the important thing, ladies and gentlemen, is to be conscious about that. And simply say, okay, look, we know when it comes to smoking that there may be uh, effects associated with contraband cigarette market. The people, when taxes go too high, they may have recourse to black market selling cigarettes. We know this is a phenomenon which does apply some in the world. We're gonna exclude this from our model. And when it comes to publishing a model, we're gonna be very upfront about that. This thing was excluded. So we consciously put it aside. We consider, put it aside for now. Maybe we'll add it in later. That's fine, that's a different version of the model. But at least it's in our list that we explicitly consider. When we go back later and we think about our priorities, we have this list of things that are excluded. So this is the division I would suggest you use for for models. And initially, this is going to include a lot of things. This is going to include probably some things, because there's some things you're just going to use constantly. And this is going to include hopefully a few, a few things. Remember, those few things could yield very interesting results by themselves. Some of the models we'll see in this course, it is striking how well they capture the phenomenology qualitative nature of what we see in the world just a couple of small things. So don't think you got to put the kitchen sink in to get serious results. Start simple, keep your endogenous set smaller, and work up from there. Okay. Now, within modeling space, um, agent-based modeling is, is particularly notable for having uh, having stirred up a lot of attention to a whole issue of, of matching patterns seen in the world. Now maybe it's because in addition to capturing dynamic patterns, patterns of change over time of variables within a model, as we can capture in classic stock and flow models, here we can capture spatial 
topological patterns. We can actually describe uh, in an emergent fashion uh, a tremendous number of different patterns we see out there. And we want our model to remain true to those patterns. Part of our model, broader model purpose is to maybe to have a model that has face validity against these patterns. That, that is in some sense consistent with. It's not obviously at variance with the basic things we know about the system. So within the agent-based modeling community, particularly in ecological modeling, there emerged a um, conviction of the importance of, of pursuing what was known as pattern-oriented modeling. And it's reflected, in fact, in the, the book that, that I suggested as a reference book for this, uh, for this course. It does an admirable job bringing this out. Um, and it's not an accident this goes along with agent-based modeling. Because often, when we have a broad model purpose to investigate a certain phenomenon, for example, or to, uh, to, to have a model that will help us evaluate trade-offs between uh, certain policies in particular areas, there may be a broad set of models, agent-based models, that are relevant to that path. And often it's our patterns that we observe that allow us to, as it were, winnow down to filter out certain of those models and focus in on certain of those models as possible, certain of those models as desirable, certain of those, of those models as, as, um, as competitive, as it were. So here we're trying to leverage a broad set of information to, ju to judge a model, to cross-check a model. And this isn't information we typically put into a model. It's information that we seek a model to match. So we often have these patterns. They're sometimes called, this in, end quote, stylized facts. And they can include reference modes, as we classically use in system dynamic patterns of change over time. But they also may, and those can be both quantitative and qualitative. You know it's rising, or it's oscillatory over time very, very relevant. Um, it goes up quickly and then comes down slowly, or what have you, like immunity. Um, but they can also be patterns of heterogeneity. These are, these are not really widely talked about as patterns to match in system dynamics models. But they're very important in age-based models. We want a model that captures the huge disparities that emerge, say, between group X and group Y in terms of healthcare, or in terms of um, uh, income or in terms of access to good housing. Um, you know, the fact that we can have great disparities nearby within a given city like Baltimore or what have you. Um, so we may want to capture stratification of the model um, in different categories of, of uh, individuals with, with very different levels of, of, uh, of income perhaps or what have you. Um, so, so we want to re reproduce those, perhaps spatial patterns. Um, uh, we've, we've seen some of them. And multi-scale phenomena. This is something, again, fairly, th to which agent-based modeling is very well suited. Because we can have this hierarchy of contexts, this hierarchy of, of uh, individuals, neighborhoods, uh, cities, etc. We'll see how we can do this quite readily in model. Um, we can characterize phenomena at each of those levels and try to hold the model true to that. So um, these patterns are pieces of information. If the model didn't mask them, it would cast suspicion on the model in terms of our purpose. They are typically specific to the purpose. Um, and we're trying to use a broad set of knowledge. Even if a given pattern is weak, you know, even if we have something like, can okay, men of higher rates of smoking than do women or something like that, um, we might be able to use it in conjunction with other patterns to, to reproduce, uh, to, to sort of confine what models are, are plausible, what particular versions of the model um, has space for it. Okay, um, time is moving on, so i uh, just going to note there's many phenomenological patterns that uh, we may try to reproduce. Okay. Um, so in the second component of this, uh, after defining model purpose, you need, to, you need to focus on the entities within the model. Um, 
And I'm going to include here most importantly agents, but also the aspects of the environment globally and locally. The states and the scale, so temporal and spatial, sort of over what period of time are you running it, and how broad is the space. So here's a, a very stylized way, uh, a model which has several scales associated with it. So we have, within this given model, this is actually built up as just a little uh, proof of concept for someone from the uh, veterinary science area, where you have farms. Within uh, a given farm, you may have animals, uh, which are held in, in say, pens at different, uh, at different locations. You have networks of farms, which have certain relationships with one another. And you may have, you may have uh, those networks leading to spread, spreading around both spatially within a farm and in between farms and animals to move around and what have you. So here we have simultaneously nesting animals are within a farm. We have networks, farms are connected with a network, and, and uh, spatial proximity of, of individuals. And we can see patterns at, at, at each, of, each of those levels that we may want to uh, reproduce. But we also want to define within our model, sort of plan, OK, what are the contexts under which agents, in which agents are, are located? Do we, do we want to capture the fact that there are neighborhoods? Are those the kind of relevant contexts that we want to be thinking about? We want to quantify things at the neighborhood level. Or to compare with data, for example, um, or to, to bring in data. Uh, are schools relevant as a, as a context, or, or cities? And then we have a broader global environment over which there might be shared aspects that affect all agents. Maybe it's, for example, the tax code. Certain taxes are applied over the entire area, or seasonality. There are certain seasonal factors that apply Know, throughout these multiple cities or what have you, certain regulations. So there's a global environment. This global environment might keep track of certain types of information across the entire, entire thing, the number of individuals with this characteristic as well. Um, local environments and agents. And you want to be asking who interacts with whom? In what capacity do they interact? So for example, farms include animals. Um, and these farms are rated in networks. We're going to have uh, states. Now, for states, the, the way this term is used in the ODD protocol, states include both parameters, and those are known in, in any logic as parameters. These are things that are basically static. Sometimes they're quasi static, they change, but only rarely. Uh, so, for example, uh, sex, ethnicity, birth date, and birthplace, those would be common examples of parameters. Um, another parameter might be associated with, well, as we've seen, um, progression of, of illness, how long it takes on average someone to recover from infectiousness or, or to lose immunity or what have you. These are parameters. These are often fixed quantities. They may vary by person, so there may be heterogeneity in these, there typically will be. So people will be of different ethnicity, different sexes, different birth dates, but for a given individual, they're, they're fixed. So we refer to those as parameters, okay? And what we'll see in any logic is it's really, really easy to create a heterogeneous population using these, but once they're created, a given individual will you know, maintain that, uh, that information. And then there's some evolving components. These are things that for an individual are changing over time. These are things that are evolving over the course of the system. So it may be their body weight and their body composition, um, their immune status, their income, their savings. Put in here age. It's a little bit subtle here because you can argue, well, look, age is really just a derived thing from the birth date and the current model time. And that gives their age. Assuming they're still alive. Um, so, continuous. And uh, there can be discrete state. Broad smoking 
in nature-based models, this is, this is not an obvious thing, but in nature-based models, you have recourse to continuous state in a way that if you were to try to map that out in an aggregate stock and flow model is problematic. So if you want to characterize a continuous quantity like income by subdividing people into stocks, you have to divide them into discrete categories, the lowest quintile, mm -hmm. the first, second, third, and fourth quartiles, or what have you, um, for, for income. Here, at an individual level, we can keep track of their income for an arbitrary level of precision. Right? Their income is this. But there are some factors we might not want to capture discreetly. We saw, where did we see a discrete description of state before? Sorry? Infection sets. That's right. We had three infection sets. That was discrete, right? We'll see in other models during the class, which is a hybrid model, where our mean status is evolved continuously, stops and flows. And that, that is an option. Um, we do a recourse to But here, um, sometimes, sometimes the sort of discrete description is adequate. Um, okay, so this characterizes the current state of, now this says the system, I should really say the agent, or if we're concentrating an agent. So uh, I, I'm going to use, within this class, state to mean evolving components, parameters to mean non-evolving components. I think that's a very important distinction. By the way, um, for those of you interested in distinctions from system dynamics, we, we talked about how people are subdivided into stocks according to their characteristics. I would note in system dynamics aggregate models, if you need to keep track of heterogeneity and some of these things, you need to subdivide it both according to parameters and according to state. So you have men and women in different stocks. And then, even though that's not evolving over time, in most cases, um, and, uh, and then you have uh, infection status is perhaps the other. So you have male susceptible, male infected, male recovered, female susceptible, infected, recovered. Um, you have to subdivide by both even though only one is, is actually changing over time. Here, this is changing, this is static, and we make use of sort of different ways of denoting them in any logic. One case, parameters. As a, in any logic, parameters, I'll just sort of flip over here uh, for a bit of variety. If we go over to any logic, you'll notice parameters, see this thing, parameter? Parameter is reified as a special sort of object. It is, it is represented as a special sort of object. By contrast, something that is varying in any logic is a variable. Now, there's some actual subtleties associated with that distinction, but suffice it to say that uh, that's a key one. So sometimes at a qualitative level, we document agent characteristics using, using what are called geomalonistros, Person, person agent who has a set of, of uh, characteristics. This is actually from a, a TV model. Um, this, in this case, it, it keeps track of whether they were um, delivered uh, for the TV infection at some point, where they delivered a vaccine upon at birth, um, and they actually have an agent state charge uh, and uh, asking if they're, they're currently infectious, etc. So we may depict the sort of information we want to maintain with the individual. So I'm going to skip uh, some subtleties for later in the course. Okay, um, we have to pick our scales typically with these models. So what's our time scale? What's our time horizon, roughly speaking? We want to decide where we are. Are we talking about years? Are we talking about months? Are we talking about decades? That's important for the sort of phenomena we're going to need to represent. Um, spatial scale. Are we talking about representing um, patterns of drug dealing within a, a, you know, neighborhoods of Baltimore? Or are we talking about a cross-country sort of model, the flow of narcotics across the U.S.? This is, this is an important um, distinction. If, if we're going to divide up quantized space into pieces, what are the size of those pieces? 
that's an important question. Now, the interesting thing here is that the extent is often determined as desire to capture emergent phenomena being simulated. Um, step size, any any size about sort of what's the smallest unit we want to be able to represent, maybe it's a household, for example. Um, this may be dictated by the desire to capture certain types of interactions between agents or evolution between agents, both in time and in space. Um, I should note that in any logic, you don't need a time step. You can go, so that's an option, but you can go as finely as you want. So any logic has what's known as an event engine, an event scheduler. And what that means is that if there's a set of events which are occurring very frequently at one time, it can go as fine as it needs to simulate that. Um, maybe there's an outbreak and it needs to simulate things at the day by day level. And then at other times, there's really very little going on, so to speak. Uh, and it can jump forward you know, days at a time, weeks at a time. So you don't need a step size, but you can have one. Um, okay, um, local environment, um, I'm just going to mention, mention this, um, so there are, there's a notion in agent-based modeling of a collective of agents. A neighborhood is plausibly a collection of households. Um, that are living within a certain area, for example. Um, you could think of a school as a collection of, of children together with a collection of, of, of staff and so on, teachers. But there's a very real question of to what degree are these, these uh, notions, do they need to be represented per se as agents? And to what degree are they simply groupings of the lower level agents? So to what degree can we simply represent a neighborhood as sort of a characteristic of households? They're divided into neighborhoods. And we don't need processes at that level. We don't need states at the neighborhood level. We don't need um, you know, parameters at that level. It's simply a collection of these things. And to what degree is it something that needs representation? To what degree? Do we have to reify it as, a, as an agent, turn it into an agent in and of itself? That is often the question here. So for example, you'll see in one of the models that I've provided to you, a uh, CWD model, model of chronic wasting disease, that we'll be looking at in some detail. And there we have herds, and there are herds of ungulates, herds of cervids um, of the sort that make their way um, around the landscape. And those herds are merely groupings of animals. They, they do not maintain any sort of information specific to our herd. And at other times, we actually want to maintain information specific to the grouping. We want processes. Like for a school, we plausibly want processes that have to do with the school. Because the school is an organizational unit that does contain children and staff, but transcends and it, it has in more information. So when we think about the environments, we want to think about, you know, are there states, aspects of state that are specific to the environment? Um, okay, the final component that I'll be talking about today has to do with um, describing processes. So we've seen We've seen how processes can be described one way using state charts. We know that state can be described in a continuous way or in a discrete way. And we can often describe the progression of that state using graphical mechanisms uh, for continuous stock and flows or an obvious one for uh, discrete. State charts are often, although not always, adequate. Often you'll have some desire to maintain some inf extra information. For example, um, we may want someone's chance of transitioning from one state to another per unit time 
to depend on how long they've been in that state. And that's readily done in any logic. You can actually ask any logic, hey, how long have you been in your current state? And it will tell you. On the other hand, you may want to keep track of other information, like history information. You know, were you ever in this state? And then have your, your you know, which way you go out of a given state depend on your past history. And that can be accomplished by maintaining extra information. But by and large, state charts form a very useful way of characterizing people's progression. And a little bit of additional code often gives you tremendous extra flexibility to transcend the sort of uh, um, natural limits of state charts. So we can build up state charts. You can use one or more than one for a given individual. And this is very powerful. So for example, we can have um, parallel state charts for different conditions. Uh, so we might have, uh, in a given individual, we want to characterize interacting conditions, vehicle risk factors such as tobacco use, tuberculosis, which is a disease that um, uh, literature suggests is adversely affected by tobacco use, both because of its impact on your immune system and because of its impact physically on, on some of the defense mechanisms your throat uh, your esophagus maintains against um, foreign particles, and uh, diabetes um, as a condition that worsens TB because of its impact particularly on immune status. So here we have three state charts in parallel. An individual will be at a given time in one state for each state chart. So each state chart, uh, the person being in a single state of that state chart. And they'll progress, and they can progress independently. We can also have interactions going on. So for example, their chance of, of uh, going and developing from a latent TB state to an active TB state, where the case where you have active disease could be worse if you're cur currently smoking. So state charts can be used to characterize a person's state with respect to multiple attributes by having multiple state charts, and they can then interact, which is a very, very powerful way of, of describing evolution along several different domains. Suffice it to say, without going into the details, that keeping track of a person's status with respect to multiple conditions is often a real pain to do at an aggregated level. Um, you could only imagine going from SIR type of thing to having to do that for two infections simultaneously. Well, instead of having three states, you now have nine states. Another, another infection, yet you have 27 states. It just expands exponentially, geometrically. Okay. Um, I think um, time is short here, and I think I'm going to... Um, call uh, call the, this a day here. I'm going to, I want to get into the issue of model formulation. And this relates to this uh, set of characteristics I've distributed on these uh, sheets. I'd like you to look at that for Friday, okay? Because we're going to be talking about several of them. Those characteristics bear on issues to think about when you're putting together a model, but also have to do with the philosophy of agent-based modeling. A, a philosophy that has a conviction that processes should be represented wherever possible as emergent within a model, not as built into a model in some fixed way. We don't preferably want, we want to avoid simply imposing a pattern on a model using fixed data. Instead, we want to be asking what processes give rise to this pattern mechanistically through their interaction so that we can have greater generality robustness of our model, so that our model can be translated to different contexts, so we can examine the effects of policies on those patterns, rather than simply building them into our model. So you will see within this sheet a set of criteria having to do with, with building up a model that you should be thinking about when you put together a model to build a model that's more robust, build a model that's more general, more versatile, more, more flexible for its application. So I'd like you to look at that for next time, and we'll talk about some of those components. 
We'll also next time have some hands-on components looking at how we build in some important <coughs> beginning elements having to do with those uh, state charts. We may start to look some at, at messaging, how, inter how agents interact via messaging. Okay. So I think that's all for today. I'm um, welcome any questions from people who are having um, uh, problems with uh, getting any logic started or licensing or getting access to the Stellar site. And I'll be seeing you uh, Friday, 1 p.m. in uh, 446, which is, again, the conference room on the fourth floor. Okay? So thanks very much. And I'll see if I can get these uh, recordings posted.